realagriculture.com presents farming forward sharpen your soil health expertise with cover cropping nitrogen management and advanced grazing brought to you by the farm resilience mentorship program Welcome to another episode of Farming Forward here on Real Agriculture. I'm Kelvin Hepner. When it comes to managing against nitrogen losses, enhanced efficiency fertilizers or EEFs can play a significant role in crop nutrient plans. On this episode, we're going to hear from Shane Ogilvie. Shane is the Director of Agricultural Innovation and Stewardship for Richardson International, talking about how EEFs work, when they should be used and how they can impact crop growth. Of course, with any application of fertilizer, it's important to use for our practices with or without enhanced efficiency products. But a common question when using EEFs is, can you decrease rates to use less fertilizer while achieving the same yields? That is possible, but rate recommendations will change over time and will affect yields differently based on different factors, including residual soil nitrogen, soil type, temperature, moisture, and other factors. So it's important to involve your agronomist whenever making those decisions. With that, let's hear from Shane on EEFs and how we can get the most out of our fertilizer products. Okay, so to start, what are ENFs? Uh, So enhanced efficiency nitrogen fertilizers are fertilizer products or fertilizer treatments that slow the release of nitrogen from the fertilizer. So the goal of this is to allow for plant availability and plant uptake to occur at the same time. And the benefits of these is that they have been demonstrated to increase yield and to improve nutrient use efficiency as well as reduce unwanted environmental losses of nitrogen. So why are nitrogen inhibitors getting so much attention in sustainability conversations? So these products have been demonstrated to reduce nitrous oxide uh, emissions, which is a greenhouse gas. And and, um, because of that, these products can be used in a climate smart agricultural practice. They are also kind of a low hanging fruit uh, approach to this because they don't require significant investment in equipment or or other on farm technology. You can basically just buy these products from your fertilizer dealer as you do conventional products, which make it a little bit easier to adopt. And are there different types of nitrogen inhibitors? Yeah, you bet. So um, there are three different kinds of uh, enhanced efficiency nitrogen fertilizer products. The first are your controlled release products. So ESN would be an example of this, and it is controlled by a physical barrier around the fertilizer. Basically, in the case of ESN, uh, water enters that prill, dissolves the fertilizer inside, and then as that polymer breaks down, then it slowly releases. The second is slow release products, which are products like uh, methylene urea. Um, Basically, they dissolve uh, slower. They have less solubility than than your conventional products. And then we have nitrogen stabilizers or biological inhibitors. And these products block or inhibit the organisms that are responsible for transforming fertilizer nitrogen into plant-available nitrogen. And then these can be further broken down into urease inhibitors or nitrification inhibitors. Urease inhibitors, they block that first step after urea. Um, So urea, of course, needs to dissolve and then becomes hydrolyzed by the urease enzyme to become ammonium. And that's where these urease inhibitors come into play. They typically last for about 10 to 14 days. Our nitrification inhibitors block that next step in the nitrogen pathway, which is nitrification. So once we have ammonium, uh, it can go through nitrification to become nitrite and then nitrate. And that first step between ammonium and nitrite is where the nitrification inhibitors come in, blocking those nitrosomonas bacteria. So when we're thinking about which loss mechanism is most likely and which product we should be using, we really have to go back to the nitrogen cycle to start this conversation. And so when we look at urea, for example, it first has to become dissolved and then hydrolyzed by the urease enzyme to become ammonium. And that's where those urease inhibitors come into play. Three things can happen to ammonium. It can either be taken up by the plant, it can be volatilized as ammonia, or it can go through that next step into nitrification to become nitrate. 
The process of nitrification then is when ammonium first becomes nitrite through um, bacteria breaking that down and then there's a second step where more bacteria breaks it down to nitrate and then nitrate can either be taken up by the plant it can be lost uh, through gaseous losses which is how nitrous oxide is formed or it can be leached out of the soil profile if there is high am amounts of rainfall. So do you want to talk about how some of these are applied and maybe how yeah, so um, there are fertilizer products that come, you know, just from the fertilizer dealer and they're just a standalone product. So examples of those would be your ESN, which is that polymer coated urea, or a Super U, for example, which contains uh, DCD and NPPT. It's a dual, uh, dual inhibitor. All of the other enhanced efficiency nitrogen fertilizer products are treated to conventional fertilizers. So in the case of urea, your egg retailer might just apply these products to the urea. In the case of UAN, it's pretty simple. You just pour the jug into the tank. And then in the case with anhydrous ammonia, depending on which product you're using, you might be able to add that to the tank or you might have to have a sidekick unit uh, with your, your application system. And where do they fit into the whole 4R cycle. Yeah, so enhanced efficiency nitrogen fertilizers fall into both source and timing within 4Rs, um, uh, not so much into rate and, and placement, um, but the, the source of course being the, the form of that fertilizer being applied and the timing not so much of when it's being applied, but when that nitrogen is being released. So when should we use inhibitors? So the process that I like to take when looking at which product works best for each individual farm or region is to first review the fertilizer practices that are occurring, uh, also the environmental conditions. And then the second is to, from that discussion, review which nitrogen loss mechanism is most likely based on those uh, practices or conditions on your individual farm. Because these products aren't all the same, they shouldn't be treated all the same, and it should be an individualized approach for your farm. And so once that has been done, then you can determine which product works best. So in the example of someone who's broadcasting their urea, your most likely loss mechanism is volatilization, and so you would want to use a urease inhibitor. If you are applying your nitrogen in the fall and you're worried about uh, denitrification losses in that spring melt period, it's because a lot of the, the nitrogen is lost before that crop even is taking up nutrients, um, then a nitrification inhibitor might be your best product. And of course, if you're broadcasting in the fall, then you probably want to use a dual inhibitor. And are there scenarios where an inhibitor or an enhanced efficiency product doesn't make sense? Yeah, so um, these products have been demonstrated to you know, increase yield and, and reduce emissions in even the lowest risk of practices, which would be considered like a um, spring banding or in-season top dress, for example. Um, but it's usually those, those higher risk scenarios when, when they're best used. So, I mean, obviously environmental conditions are a huge part of this. Do you want to talk about the importance of maybe trialing a few years in a row because no year is the same? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, the three key benefits of these products are that they increase yield, they increase nutrient use efficiency, and they can reduce those unwanted environmental losses of nitrogen. All three of those things can vary greatly based on environmental conditions from year to year. And so it is very important to look at these products on your own farm for multiple years before you know, making a decision of whether or not they work. So if I were to summarize all this, I think the most important thing to do is to go through the process of working with your trusted advisor or your 4R designated agronomist to look at your operation and your environmental conditions, figure out which loss mechanism is most likely on your farm, and then pick a product that works for that loss mechanism best. The second thing would be do lots of on-farm trials, uh, do them year over year, and see how these products are actually working for you and, and benefiting your yield and your profitability. And then the last thing, these products are only part of a 4R nutrient management strategy. They only look at source and timing. So we want to make sure that we're soil testing for your, your, your right rate and ensuring we're putting it in the right place for, for not only loss mechanisms, but uh, plant availability as well.
If you enjoyed this video and want to continue to sharpen your soil health expertise, encourage you to go to farmlearninghub.ca to learn more.